walk step or walking. And perfect, <laughs> perfect timing on the recording because now <laughs> when I'll just introduce walk jump for the first time. Uh, and then separately, we uh, train a score based model to handle the denoising uh, piece. And this is what we call the jump step that goes from the noisy data back to the clean data. And in the next couple of slides, I'm basically just going to reiterate these points over and over in different ways, alternating between some uh, giving you some flavor for the, the formalism and more intuition. So in ML uh, and in diffusion in particular, this, this broad intuition of why we want to, to work in the space of noisy data is pretty well established now. You can imagine this really simple case where you have data density, uh, you know, in just these these two places. So maybe these are you know proteins you know about, and you don't know anything else about the space. If you're trying to estimate the score function, the gradient of the log probability, that's only going to be accurate. It's only going to work near the place where you have data density, and it's going to be inaccurate everywhere else. So what's the solution? You perturb or smooth this. Uh, uh, this density, this data density, the easiest way to do that is by adding noise, uh, and that makes your score function accurate over um, this kind of full space that you're trying to model. Okay, so this is very high level intuitive. What does that mean uh, for walk jump? How do we actually train these models and what's the formalism? I'm going to splash some equations for you and give give a feeling for how we actually developed um, these models, because again, it's, uh, it is a different paradigm than diffusion. So it will be unfamiliar to basically everybody, but then I'm going to return to some intuition. Uh, so, so, um, don't worry too much and I'll keep alternating. Um, this is just to, to give people an idea, right? Depending on if you're coming from an ML background, mostly something like a categorical noising process or a masking process is going to be very familiar to you. If you're from more of a protein or biology background, you know, you do this kind of thing too um, with the technique like alanine or histidine scanning, uh, where you just knock out particular residues in a sequence, replace them with something and ask what changed or what should go there. Okay, so this is the formalism uh, that we start with with walk jump sampling. It's based on uh, a concept called neural empirical base. And again, the key idea is very, very simple here. We still want to train a score-based model, uh, but we don't want to do it on many noise scales and have to deal with this noise schedule, reverse diffusion, forward diffusion uh, complication. We just want a single noise scale that smooths our data and where we can train generative models. So that's exactly what we do. Uh, in our case, we add isotropic Gaussian noise to the inputs. This is very general right now. I'll make it specific to proteins a little bit later. Um, and then we train a score-based model on this smoothed noisy data. Why do you want to do this? Again, just very intuitive. The uh, probability function of x is going to be, the probability density is going to be very coarse and rugged in general for discrete data, whereas p of y is smooth. It's easy to model and easy to sample from. And in particular, if we add noise of a very of a very specific form, then the noisy data y depends in a known way on the clean data x. So x here is your clean inputs. This is say a sequence of amino acids, and y is some noisy smoothed version of that. And we understand um, exactly what this dependence is. So how would you train a score-based model in this smooth, noisy space? That is uh, where we invoke what's called neural empirical base. So if the noise is isotropic and Gaussian, then it's possible to write down exactly how to recover X, the clean data, from Y, and what that estimator should look like. Um, and so that's exactly this formula here. And if you remember what a score-based model does, shown right here, score-based model is just the gradient of the log probability density. So we can substitute that in. 
And now we have a, a very simple formula that gets us from um, this noisy data Y back to the clean data that we care about protein sequences. And it only depends on this learn score function that can be trained very easily with an L2 loss. So this is just an L2 loss that compares the actual clean data and um, our, our estimate of it. So this is very standard for how you would train a score-based model, except now we only have to do this over a single noise scale, which is given by sigma here. Okay, so that is the formalism. What does that actually mean? What does it look like? Very, very simple. Okay, so you have clean data X shown here. We noise it by adding isotropic Gaussian noise. Then you have this nice smooth manifold here. And all we're trying to do is learn a score function G that acts like a compass that takes us from this noisy data and recovers the clean data. Or in our kind of nomenclature, it jumps back to the clean data. So this is the procedure for how we train a denoising network that learns scores on a smooth manifold. We can do the same thing for energies and for energy-based models. Now, instead of training with a denoising loss, we're gonna train with contrastive divergence, exactly like you would train any other EBM. The, the really key point here though, is that again, the model is only seeing, well, in this case, the model is only ever seeing the noisy data. So it doesn't care about what your real protein sequence representation is. Uh, it's just seeing this smoothed form of the data after you've added noise to it. And then during training, you do Langevin MCMC to sample from the model uh, and you train with contrastive divergence. So the model is trying to decrease the energy of the training samples, which are just the noisy training samples and then increase the energy of the noisy data that it's sampling during training. So this does make training quite a bit slower than just a simple uh, L2 denoising objective. Um, but it also gives you this really nice equivalent that you are training the EBM to produce noisy data. Uh, and that's exactly what you're going to ask for at sampling time as well. So I've introduced these two totally separate neural networks now. One is a score-based denoiser, and the other is an energy-based model that is trying to learn an energy function over this smooth data. These two models are totally decoupled. They don't interact with each other at all. They're, they're, complete, they're trained completely independently. And at no point did I say noise schedule uh, or reverse diffusion or, or anything like that. There's just a single noise schedule. There's, sorry, there's a single noise level, sigma, which is the amount of noise that you add to your, your training data. To make this very concrete for proteins, this is what we do in walk jump sampling. So take uh, an amino acid sequence and transform it into one hot vectors. So the simplest representation possible, it's just vector that tells you what amino acid is in each position add isotropic Gaussian noise to that one hot vector and train an energy-based model that learns an energy function over these noisy one hot encodings. Uh, now you have a trained generative model. You can sample new noisy data, these like noisy pseudo one hot uh, type of objects. You can sample those from your energy-based model and you have a separately trained denoising model that jumps back to the, the real protein sequences that, that you meant to generate the whole time. So it's a two-step two -step process. And this is just saying that in equations. So the EBM uh, samples, we can sample new protein sequences with Langevin MCMC using the energy-based model. And then this is kind of a neat, um, a neat fact uh, of walk jump, because we're not doing a progressive denoising in any way, every single sample, every single step of the Langevin MCMC, it's possible to jump back with the denoising network and generate a real valid protein sequence. 
So uh, if you take everything I just said and your takeaway is just, okay, this is a generative modeling framework that uses single, does single step denoising or single step diffusion. You can think about it that way and you'll have gotten most of the, the big ideas. Um, the advantage of course is because of the single noise scale, the simplicity um, and the fact that everything works really robustly. Uh, it's much, much better than diffusion for um, protein sequence generation. And uh, the rest of the talk will be me showing you results to, to back that up. I want to give you just a kind of picture of what this looks like in practice. Um, again, as kind of like a cool, uh, cool demonstration. And so like I said, because every single sample is, is valid, unlike a diffusion model or a molecular dynamic simulation that's going to explore a conformational landscape of you know, different 3D geometries. Walk jump sampling is going to do what I call alchemical ensemble exploration. So in this video, what you're seeing is at every single step, or it doesn't have to be every step, you could do every n steps of sampling. You can jump back to a real antibody sequence I fold all of those sequences with Equifold, which is possible because Equifold is very, very fast. Uh, and then I can generate this movie <laughs> and my pymol scales aren't that great. So the, uh, the color changes uh, at every single step. So I'll pause the video to, to make sure nobody uh, passes out. Um, but, but yeah, so you get a, get a sense for what we're doing with walk jump sampling is you're able to explore a local mutational neighborhood instead of a conformational one. So every single step we're making local mutations with the sampler. It's very, very easy to visualize that and, and see what's, do, what's um, happening. And you can just run sampling continuously as, as a single chain of Langevin MCMC. And uh, the method will not mode collapse. Um, it will mode explore. So it will just kind of run through all of the modes uh, of the data. So it's you actually don't need to sample a thousand times to generate a thousand samples. You can just sample a, a single chain um, and collect samples however you'd like. You could also do what we call gradient flow, which is again, where we do, uh, instead of doing Langevin MCMC, we just follow this learn score function and we follow it directly to the local minima uh, in in the energy landscape. So if you start at some protein um, and you want to see, like, based on everything that my model has learned about the training data that I gave it, what is kind of the in its local neighborhood the most you know the most likely sequence here, the most likely protein, uh, you can do that very easily with gradient flow as well. All right, so before I show some wet lab results, I'll go through the kind of cursory in silico evaluation. Um, we, compare, we compare walk jump against uh, discrete diffusion baseline, um, an alternative um, score-based baseline, uh, autoregressive models like IGLM, uh, mass language models like ESM2. Um, I also did a kind of fun benchmark using GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. And, and tried to get them to do um, few shot prompting to, to do antibody design tasks. I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody is interested later. There's pretty interesting findings there. Um, what all these summary statistics are showing is just that walk jump creates samples that look the most like the training data, in this case, antibodies from um, the paired observed antibody space data set. Uh, they're all unique. Um, they look the most like the training data in terms of properties. So they're the most antibody-like while simultaneously being uh, further away from the training data than, than any of these other methods. So the samples are very antibody-like, but also very novel uh, with high internal diversity. So very different from one another. Um, the performance metrics uh, are mostly just to show that if you have a single noise level, um, you can obviously train and sample much, much faster than you can if you have a diffusion model or if you're doing left to right decoding with an autoregressive model, because uh, everything we're doing is non-autoregressive, right? So it's very, very fast. 
um, with low low memory and time requirements. Um, so that's what I just said. Block jump outperforms kind of all of these other frameworks and formalisms uh, in terms of sample quality while having uh, comparable sample quality to discrete diffusion. Um, probably surprising to no one, discrete diffusion is a great way to do generative modeling. So sample quality from discrete diffusion is very, very good. Uh, we're just able to do equally as good or better uh, with better sequence diversity and with faster sampling and training as well. Now I'll move to an actual uh, in vitro lab experiment result. So this is a task um, that we kind of designed based on uh, trastuzumab and this antigen called HER2. So there's a data set from this paper, uh, mut uh, mutagenesis data set, where they take a known therapeutic antibody that binds to this target, HER2, and they do a bunch of mutations in one very specific subsequence, one, one region of that antibody which is called CDRH3. You just remember this H3 part here. Um, and so they generate 9,000 uh, new designs that still bind to the target. Again, only with mutations in that small region. Um, the region has length 10, so it's a 10 to the 13th dimensional search space when you consider all the possible amino acid substitutions that you could do. It's a very non-trivial uh, generation and search space problem. And the task that we set up, uh, this is kind of an attempt to make an ML benchmark style task, but doing a real biology experiment. Um, you know, there are a lot of complications there, but it's, uh, it's our best attempt. So again, yeah, the task is to generate novel designs that only redesign this particular region of the antibody, H3, uh, the design should retain binding to the target measured in a lab assay. Um, and those designs need to be novel. So they have to be, you know, larger than one at a distance from anything in the training data set. Uh, and of course, not just um, the, the starting sequence, which is trastuzumab. Okay, so this is really like the top level um, uh, result or poster board for Walk jump sampling. Um, so we did this task. Uh, we got 70% of our designs on the first attempt bound to this target. Um, this is a plot of uh, the binding affinity versus the edit distance from, from that starting point, trastuzumab. Um, the edit distances from the training data set look very, very similar. So on average, they're around five to six edits different from anything observed in the training data. And some of the binders are all the way up to eight or nine. So almost completely redesigning the, the allowed region. Um, so again, compared to any other ML method we've seen in the, in the literature that's attempted to do this task, uh, or even like a computational method like Rosetta, um, this is a much, much higher rate. Uh, we tried some additional experiments where we use things like Rosetta and other structural priors to see if that kind of matters at all or, or helps us create more binders. Um, but, but really just the walk jump designs, just as they are, achieve a binding rate of 70%. And uh, there's no additional filtering that we did that helped improve that binding rate. Although you can increase the binding affinity to the target by using other types of filters. So uh, this is just a summary of um, kind of these lab results in, in the language actually from Brian's paper. Uh, you know, what walk jump is, is basically a, a language only model. I maybe didn't say this before, but in case it wasn't clear, there's no structure at all anywhere in this process, except when we fold things with Equifold just to look at them. Uh, so this is a language only model that implicitly learns structure and biophysics. So we get into this high intrinsic fitness region by having a model that proposes things with high likelihood. Uh, and this is reflected in the fact that almost 100% of our designs were successfully expressed and purified um, in the first, the first time we tried, we attempted to in lab experiments. 
And then same thing for extrinsic fitness, where we're trying to achieve function. Um, uh, like I said, 70% of the designs are binders um, to this target compared to less than 30% for other for diffusion models, both in sequence and in structure sequence space that have attempted to do this task. So we can train on a high extrinsic fitness neighborhood and sample more sequences that are in this neighborhood. I, I want to um, give you the impression that we have indeed kind of solved this very narrow problem of sampling things in a neighborhood uh, and also tell you um, very, very clearly that there are lots of other problems that walk jump doesn't solve and <laughs> that it doesn't do well. Uh, one that might be pretty obvious is I haven't mentioned anything about guided sampling or trying to guide designs towards a particular place. Uh, and this is something that we do um, on purpose all the time in our own discovery campaigns. Um, walk jump is really just a method that tries to produce sequences that are novel, but have the same properties of the sequences that you trained it on. So it's really, really good for sequence exploration and sequence uh, diversification. Um, this is a, a metric that we built in-house to measure that. Um, and that's exactly what, what you see here is that walk jump designs uh, look very similar to known functional antibodies um, based on this collection of metrics that we compute. And that's by design. That's what walk jump is, is meant to do. Um, because of that, it can do cool things like improve expression yield, uh, improve the amount of, of protein that you're able to make, uh, can fix chemical liabilities and improve binding affinity. So it can do all these multi-objective optimization type things, but only because uh, you can train it on sequences that uh, have the properties you want and now come up with novel sequences that have combinations of those properties um, or or you know, are sampling from the tail of a distribution. And that allows you to do multi-objective optimization. Um, but right, so like I mentioned before, walk jump doesn't do guidance by itself. There's nothing guided about the method. So when we're actually trying to design a new therapeutic, uh, we're starting from scratch and we have no data, we have to collect data. We have to explore the mutational space around new proteins. Um, and so that's where walk jump is really good and very useful because we want to be exploring designs that are interesting and will have cool function and will actually express in the lab. Um, but we don't have any uh, labeled data for which we can apply um, guidance, right? Because we can't train any models to predict properties uh, and and do guided sampling if we don't have any labels and therefore if we, we don't have any training data. Um, so, right, so we do unguided sampling first. And as we kind of systematically build up that training corpus and we can train classifiers to predict the things that we care about, then it makes more and more sense to try to uh, move from exploration into exploitation and actually guide sampling to exactly where you want to go, exactly the, the sort of uh, optimized molecules that, that you're looking for. Um, and this, this kind of trade-off between unguided and guided methods happens very naturally with active learning. Uh, I won't talk about it today, but with work led by Nate Groover and Sam Stanton, uh, we do have a lot of work in the diffusion space uh, and we proposed um, a new way to do guided discrete diffusion, which was just accepted to NeurIPS as a spotlight presentation. Um, and in that work, we tackle this separate question of, of guided generation, but I will let Nate and Sam cover that in detail, maybe at a future talk at, at this series. So with that, I want to summarize um, what we've done. Uh, so, Discrete walk jump sampling is this new paradigm for discrete generative modeling in a very general way. We use it for molecular discovery uh, and it only requires a single noise scale and no noise schedule. And that gives us a bunch of benefits in terms of 
uh, both sample quality and performance um, and uh, robustness of actually being able to, to easily train and sample from these models. So I kind of made this bold claim that at least for us in the, the, this narrow domain of trying to interpolate a sequence space uh, to achieve sequence diversification and, and exploration, um, discrete walk jump sampling is a really, really good solution to that problem. And that's what we use it for. The paper with um, all kinds of details and uh, more theory and algorithms written out is here. It's on archive. It was featured as a spotlight in the iClear workshop on physics for machine learning a couple months ago. Uh, and then all of our code is open source here on GitHub in the walk jump. Um, before I finish, I want to really thank and acknowledge Dan Berenberg and Saeed Saremi. This, all of the discrete walk jump work was joint work between me, Dan, and Saeed. And then Andreas Lucas and Vlad Gligloracevic uh, were really instrumental um, on all of the antibody generative modeling side of things. All right, so thank you very much. Um, for your attention, please feel free to ask me questions now, to reach out on email, um, on the health site, if you prefer that. Um, yeah, and we're always, you know, looking to, to chat with people who are interested in, in ML for cool biology problems.